Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahedo Bible Study Podcast. As always, at the front, I will remind you of the three S's, support, share, and subscribe. You can subscribe wherever you find this, be it YouTube, Anchor, Transistor, Google, Apple, or Spotify. You can share the words of God that you hear me recite and read aloud or the link to where you found this. And you can support by subscribing to the newsletter at $5 a month at aksum.substack.com. That's A-K-S-U-M dot substack.com. Or at any level at patreon.com slash tawahado. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. We are still in the scroll of the apocalypse. That brings us to Revelation chapter 6 or uncovering chapter 6. We'll begin with verses 1 to 4. And today I'm reading from the Revised Standard Version or the RSV. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, as with a voice of thunder, Come! And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering, and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that men should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. Here we have the idea that God is always in control, and he moves people who have bows, and he moves people who have sword, or for that matter, nuclear weapons, or AK-47s, or handguns. God was behind the Assyrians, God was behind the Babylonians, God was behind the Persians, God was behind the Egyptians, and yea, even God is behind the Americans. Earlier this year, it was the beginning of the Jubilee year, the 50th year of teaching of Father Paul Nadim Tarazi. And so in fellowship with my beloved Greek Orthodox brothers and sisters, I presented a paper that I will later this year uh, present a refined version for amongst my is right fellowship for a patristic brotherhood that we have. And that paper was on the word kasht, which in Hebrew means both bow and rainbow, and the g is equivalent, kust. There's a Semitic cognate there. There's often a shift between the S and the SH, and we see that even within the Hebrew uh, letter, sheen, which depending on where you put the Masoretic dot on the left or the right, it could be seen or it could be sheen. And so that behavior of, of uh, switching around from S to H is present in the Ethiopic languages like Gez and Tigrinya and Amharic. You see it if, even in my grandfather's name, the word for king, which is taskmaster in other Semitic languages, is Negus. So you see Negus becomes Nagash. And you also have Nagashi or Nagasi, depending on people's accents and pronunciations. All that's to say, Kasht and Kast mean bow and rainbow. And the connection I made in that paper is that both the bow and the rainbow, the rainbow not being a symbol of the LGBTQ movement, although it's been appropriated that way now, but being the symbol of the covenant of Noah, and the bow being the symbol of power at the time of the writing of the Hebrew Bible, the bow and the rainbow, the kasht, represents the judgment of God, as does the sword that I mentioned he uses through the various empires of the day, be it Assyria, Babylonia, Persia, Egypt, or even the empires that we've seen in the 20th and 21st centuries, the British Empire and the American Empire. Verses 5 to 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the living, the third living creature say, Come. And I saw, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a balance in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures, saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, but do not harm oil and wine. In economics, in politics, in the mercato, 
in the marketplace, you hear of price fluctuation, you hear of inflation, deflation, stagnation, price controls, currency exchanges, and bank runs. You hear of fiat currency and precious metals-based currencies like gold and silver. Nowadays, you even hear of digital fiat currency instead of fiat from the government, fiat from the people. You hear about Bitcoin and other altcoins or other names people have for altcoins, which are less prestigious and less majestic. Whatever the point, you hear again that the control of God is behind the fluctuations the ups and downs, the tergiversating, the oscillations of the marketplace. Verses 7 to 8. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I saw, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death. And Hades followed him. And they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. This is one of those segments of Revelation which have been infamous or famous, depending on your perspective, throughout the past 2,000 years. These are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You can see in popular culture things like the X-Men cartoon and, and others who take advantage, but you have the sword representing war, you have famine, you have pestilence, you have wild beasts. I want to reflect a little bit on the, the wild beasts. I wrote an article a number of years ago on the Marian prayer. We have a Marian prayer to the Virgin Mary that was found in uh, the Coptic rite in the Greek language about 200 AD. It's very impressive. And we have the contemporary version in Ge'ez, which I translated. It says, as we prostrate before you, we say salutations to you, Mary, our mother, and trust that your intercession will protect us from wild animals, or you could say from predatory beasts. What I found fascinating about this is that you see the combination of famine and wild beasts in the scroll of Ezekiel. You see that in chapter 5 of the scroll of Ezekiel. But then when you go on to chapter 34 of the scroll of Ezekiel, you find that the connection is made between these wild animals or these predatory beasts and false teachers and false prophets. That is, prophets who do not function in the right way, who do not have thoughts, words, and deeds aligned with the thoughts of the Lord of the Dabare way of the word of God. And so the line in Ezekiel chapter 34 says, they became food for all the wild animals. You go back to verses one to three, you have the Dabar Yahweh, the word of the Lord came to me, mortal, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say to them, to the shepherds, thus says the Lord, ah, you shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the sheep. So self-serving preachers, priests, prophets, teachers, and leaders of all sorts are considered wild beasts, predatory animals. And they are defended against by the shepherd of our souls, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now we have verses 9 to 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true how long before thou wilt judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell upon the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. The Greek word for martyr is witness or testimony. So these martyrs are slain for the Dabar Yahweh, for the matter or the word, the instruction of the Lord, of God. And vengeance is not theirs. Vengeance is the Lord's. The Lord is the only avenger. It's very fascinating in Amharic culture. We name our, our children Dammalash, the returner of blood, 
and Damise, destroyer, or the one who gets rid of one's blood. And these titles are totally inappropriate, which is why I'm glad we also, on the 40th day for boys and on the 80th day for girls, rebaptized, so that even when we individually stray from the path, as a community, because we've accepted Orthodox Christianity, we will have names befitting of Christians. Maybe even something like Returner of Grace rather than Returner of Blood, and rather than Destroyer, Healer. Verses 12 to the end. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth, as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the generals, and the rich, and the strong, and everyone, slave and free, hid in the caves, and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who was seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand before it? It's very amazing. There is no distinction between humankind anymore. I mean, on its face, we see kings, presidents, prime ministers, princes. We see great men. We see generals. We see people who think they are rich. We see people who think that they are strong. We see slaves and free. And yet, when that dread day of the Lord comes, it all goes away. Recently, I watched the, the Netflix show Barbarians. And it's set in the time period of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the early first century. He would have been a, a little boy or a teenager at the time. And the big distinction in that show is between the civilized Roman soldiers and the hierarchy and stratification of Roman society uh, representing the city versus the desert dwelling, wilderness dwelling, jungle dwelling, Germanic tribesmen who are called barbarians by the Romans. And it's fascinating that we create these classes of human beings, but on the judgment day, all will be judged according to their thoughts, words, and deeds, according to how much was revealed and uncovered to them. Finally, I was studying Amos chapter 5 this week, and especially in verses 18 to the end, you hear talk about the day of the Lord. And lest you think that the Apostle John is making up this imagery of terror of the day of the Lord, let me put a fright in you by closing out today's chapter 6 with chapter 5 of Amos, verses 18 to the end. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord! Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him or went into the house and leaned with his hand against the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and cereal offerings, I will not accept them, and the peace offerings of your fatted beasts I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Did you bring to me sacrifices and offerings the forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You shall take up Sakuth your king and Kaiwan your star god, your images which you made for yourselves. Therefore I will take you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord whose name is the God of hosts. I've always found this incredible. I believe it's in uh, Acts chapter 7, but somewhere in Acts, this is quoted as well. And uh, so, yeah, there, it always ends on a note of hope, but we have to have some trepidation when we think of Judgment Day, of the day of the Lord. Glory to God for all things, and may he make us unashamed at his second coming.